ourselves so that you guys kind of know where we're coming from and what our training is and our interest in healthcare and why we feel the importance of need to have um, a, you know, your own personal directive for healthcare. My interest in healthcare is I used to work in healthcare. I was a paramedic for about 10 years. And the reason I got out of that field was the autonomy issues. Um, they started telling us when you go into someone's house, you have to call a certain state agency if you think the carpet is not, is, is not flat enough because it's a fall hazard. Um, you're required to take a look around the house. They were, you know, you're going, somebody's calling you for help and you're being stuck in the house and saying, well, let me just uh, spy around just a little bit. Do you, do you comply with all your medications? Um, as well as instances where I'm required to tell someone, well, yeah, you don't want to go to the hospital, but you're coming with me anyway. Um, and of course, if I chose to just ignore that law, it wasn't that simple because the police would come with us. Um, and the police would say, no, no, you're taking them, and we'll tie them up and throw them in your ambulance, and you'll take them, or else you'll get arrested too. Um, so it wasn't like you could just walk away and do the agorist, or the, uh, not agorist, but the, the ins, uh, fight from the inside type thing. It wasn't that simple. Um, and so my interest in healthcare is I would like to go back into it. I would love to practice healthcare with patients who actually want treatment and not run the risk of running into state aggression on uh, every call that I, that I run. Um, so since then I've worked in the fire service and I've been a teacher. Um, I became a teacher for seven years at a private school. So the issue there was of course the parents forced the kids into it. But at least a lot of them hadn't been to school for like a year. Um, and I could do whatever I wanted in my classroom, which usually was you know, not very much that the students didn't want to do. Um, currently I'm a professor at the University of Hartford, uh, where there's no mandatory attendance laws, um, because it's college. Um, and in theory, they want to be there. Um, in practice, of course, we have a credential-driven society that makes them sit there and pay a ton of money and zone off every once in a while. But I can feel better because I'm not getting that money. I'm getting, you know, pittance per class as an adjunct. So that at least makes me feel a little better. Um, and I also run a, a company providing help to homeschoolers and unschoolers who are uncomfortable with some subject or another. And I'm Katie McCall, and I'm a New Hampshire midwife. Um, I originally moved to New Hampshire because the state of California um, pursued me with a felony conviction for um, caring for a family in um, their birth choices um, when I was a student midwife that wasn't yet um, licensed. Um, and part of the reason that I came to New Hampshire was because um, this was one of the only states where I could work, where I um, knew that I could actually practice freely without being afraid of being um, pursued or sanctioned in some way for um, providing for families' choices. Um, and uh, I also um, am part runner of Stone Farm, which is a bed and breakfast uh, here in New Hampshire. Um, and I work at a midwifery training school um, that teaches women who are um, wanting to go into, and men who are wanting to go into midwifery, we just haven't had a male applicant yet. Um, and uh, in that process, I'm also trying to get other healthcare providers, other people with skills, uh, emergency skills training and family health training um, to put together um, online classes so that people can learn to care for themselves and for their family and for their neighbors and loved ones instead of having to run to the ER, you know, every time something um, that they, they're not familiar with happens. Um, so that's kind of my background. And um, in pursuing midwifery, I went through seven years of medical training. Um, and during that time um, was, I, I think that's really when I came face to face with the whole liberty idea in connection with healthcare, um, because there was there was definitely a rift between some some individuals who were studying to become midwives who were really wanting to do that because they wanted to care for each individual's family with choice, you know, the way that they wanted to have their babies, the way they wanted to care for their children. Um, and another group of students that were very much, you know, we want to be recognized by the state, we want to be able to be looked up to, you know, we want to be able to collect insurance, and those things really kind of came head to head for um, a lot of situations and a lot of, um, a lot of 
really action that we would try to do as a group. Um, so I think that both of us have um, this mutual understanding of the fact that once you are licensed as a healthcare provider, which I am in New Hampshire and chose to be, um, <laughs> um, once you're licensed, you basically are working for the state. So you, if you have this um, understanding of uh, individuals' rights and autonomies to be able to like make the choices in their healthcare, um, you inevitably are going to come up in a situation where you know the, the patient doesn't want to go, <laughs> and the state says I have to take them, and you can't grab people by the hair and you know yank them out the door, um, and so that conflict comes up, and it's actually come up for me more in New Hampshire than it did in California, which was really strange for me after having lived here now for two years. Um, so I, I think I'm speaking for you in saying that that's like one of the biggest issues I think that comes up for licensed providers. Right, I mean, I'm more concerned with the patient than I am with myself, right. but, but absolutely. Um, it's an interesting turn of phrase to say once you're licensed, you work for the state. Mm -hmm. So obviously the state defines a license as permission to do something which is otherwise illegal. Mm -hmm. But uh, the reality is, when you get that license, you open yourself up to a whole bunch of laws that now apply to you mm -hmm. that didn't apply 10 minutes before you got that license. And I've, I kept my paramedic license, mm -hmm. uh, even though I'm not working. And the reality is, you know, now I'm a mandatory reporter on child abuse, mm -hmm. and there's plenty of cases that are not actually abuse that I would go to jail for not reporting if I were to come across them. Luckily, I just, you know, don't see children very often. <laughs> Keep my eyes closed and such. Um, and of course, there are real instances of child abuse that, that don't get reported. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can't say you know, schools give too much detention and make kids read stuff and force them to do homework. I mean, nobody would count that as abuse. Um, and, and then if you don't go, your parents go to jail. Um, but, no, but that's an account of abuse. But yeah, you have all these additional uh, laws put on you. So yes, you have permission to do something otherwise illegal, which shouldn't be otherwise illegal. Um, and yet, at the same time, you have uh, you, you have the, the, you lose some of your legal standing. Um, you know, I go to a, to a naturopath as my primary care physician, and I believe they're licensed in 14 states. And I look and, you, and you, I see the same rift there. You know, in the states where they're not licensed, you see some people saying, "We need get licensing in these states." Other people saying, "Why do you want to put yourself under the auspices of of, of the law? Why don't if you know what you're doing?" Why don't you just treat patients? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, my father is an opt optometrist, an um, optometric physician now, and he's not allowed to use silver to treat eye infections um, because you have to use prescription antibiotics, which you know, pharmaceuticals have trademarks on. Even though silver will kill gram negative, gram positive, it'll work, uh, but you can't use it. But homeopathic eye drops do contain silver. So he doesn't believe in, homeopath in, in homeopathy. But he can suggest, I think you should try these homeopathic eye drops to somebody who, um, who has uh, an eye infection. But every time he does it, he risks losing his license if somebody figures out what he's doing. Whereas if he was in a non-licensed profession and just said, here, I bought these at the five and nine, try them. There's no legal liability. He, he, he's not in any privileged position. Uh, which I think is, is interesting. When the state gives you a privilege, it makes sense that what comes with it is the ability for them to take it away and to sanction you. So we kind of find ourselves um, in healthcare in a very similar boat with um, kind of the whole medical marijuana and legalization versus decriminalization um, in the sense that decriminalizing medicine is really, I think, the um, best step that can be made towards reestablishing patient autonomy because um, as it stands right now, there's not a single state where you can practice medicine without a license, without facing sanction of some way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. um, in some states, um, like the one that I left, um, you can end up with a felony and become a second-class citizen and lose your livelihood. So um, it behooves people who want to care for individuals and who have educated themselves to be able to support them. Um, it behooves them to go through the licensure pro process to at least kind of protect their families and not be put in a cage. Um, and yet, at the same time, uh, we find ourselves with our hands tied in what we can do and what we can't do, what we're allowed to say, what we're not allowed to say. Um, and just as a, I 
us a, a picture of that. Um, one of the kind of clearest views I've been able to get of this recently is I live very close to the Massachusetts and New Hampshire border. New Hampshire requires me to have a license. Massachusetts does not require me to have a license. As a matter of fact, they don't even recognize midwives who might as well be invisible over there. Um, yet we are protected from being sanctioned as midwives because there was a case years ago where a nurse was um, arrested and they tried to charge her with practicing medicine or uh, midwifery without a license because she didn't have any sort of licensing outside of her nursing. Um, and the court decided that midwifery actually wasn't medicine. So anytime a midwife works in Massachusetts, she's not practicing medicine. So <laughs> there are lots of midwives in Massachusetts. And it's so backwards for me because I always hear, you know, oh, Taxachusetts and, you know, Massachusetts is so blah, blah, blah. And all these people from Massachusetts moving to New Hampshire and um, yet for at least women's health care, it's very much the opposite. Um, so I have clients that I care for in Massachusetts, and I have clients that I care for in New Hampshire. And when I go to Massachusetts, I can pretty much care for any woman the way that she needs to be cared for, the way she wants to be cared for. It's completely voluntary. It's a total mutual exchange. Um, we can practice agorism. We can barter for stuff. Um, I can take on clients for free. <laughs> you know, I can let women who've had, you know, several C-sections be able to have the baby after having C-sections in their home and water. Um, in New Hampshire, there are very, very strict guidelines on what I can and can't do. So um, I find myself in conversations with women all the time in New Hampshire where I say, well, this is how, you know, health-wise you should be cared for. But New Hampshire says I have to tell you X, Y, Z. Um, and it's very frustrating. Um, so I thought that um, probably a good way to go out, actually before we go there, we should probably talk a little bit about um, HIPAA <laughs> and, um, and the, the new affordable health care um, and how that is affecting um, medicine and access to care. Um, and please feel free to, you know, if you have stuff on this. A couple of things that I just really think is important for people to understand is um, HIPAA is that paperwork that you sign whenever you go into a healthcare provider's office um, that supposedly protects them from you know sharing any of your confidential healthcare records with anybody. Um, and if you read through it, which I think most people don't read through it, <laughs> it's long and very boring. Um, the end of the HIPAA disclosure basically says that you understand that the state can access your records if they want to, which is really what it means. <laughs> I mean, you have the one side of the protection, and then you also have the other side of the fact that the state does have um, access to your medical records and can look at them if they need to and want to. Kind of reminds you of, you know, don't steal, the state hates competition. Right. You know, yeah. it's, it's a law that's, that protects your privacy. Nobody else can see your records except us. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you have the implementation, I don't know if you're going to get to this, through the Affordable Care Act, which requires effective medical record keeping, requires certain formats for electrical records, makes it so much easier <laughs> for the state to actually get at it rather than having to say, hmm, we want to look at this person's records, we want to find everyone's record who owns a gun, and we want to see uh, what, what we can tie it to or whatever we want to do. Uh, we want to find everyone who drinks raw milk and data mine for cases that could have been hysteria to build our case against uh, raw milk. I live in the only state that has, um, that actually you can sell raw milk just in the store um, perfectly legally without pretending to own a cow. Sell it in New Hampshire. You can buy raw milk in the store. Really? Mm -hmm. Buy it every week. Mm -hmm. yep. right, here store. Right, right here in Manchester. Mm -hmm. I live in one of two states. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, California, I know, have it for a while, a long time, and lost it uh, rather recently. Um, yeah, it's New Hampshire. the backflips of mm -hmm. all the milk producers claiming that they're selling some crazy share of a cow, but you don't know that. You go and buy it retail and it feels like right. you're buying milk, but somewhere behind the scenes, contractually, they do their gymnastics. Yes, everything. yeah. That, that's New Hampshire or California? New York. New York. Mm -hmm. yeah. In Texas, I actually had to drive to a farm and yeah, I could actually see my piece of the cow. We only had 30 people, so I mean, literally, yeah, you had a pretty big portion of the cow, actually. The cows are pretty big. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We've been through the medical intake process a few times in the past few weeks for prenatal care, and we 
read every single word of every single paper that's been put in front of us. And the HIPAA thing, it doesn't only say that the state, it, it's carefully worded to say not only that the state can access your records, but also that uh, accredited medical institutions undergoing research pursuant to blah, 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 also. Yeah. They can share it with whoever they want. Yeah. And it's like, wow. It's so. <laughs> well, and it's, it's interesting, I think, um, for example, this is another thing with being crossing the border all the time for the work that I do. Um, in Massachusetts, they've obviously had this, you know, everybody has health care thing going on for a while. So it's almost like you can see New Hampshire in the future. <laughs> you know, it's like this is kind of where everybody's going. And, you know, they're not quite there, but they're definitely in a place where the expectation that everybody has health care, that it's all the state of Mass, that it's all Mass Health, um, is a very real thing that people experience. And it is fascinating to me how unhealthy the people are compared to New Hampshire. <laughs> like, it is scary, scary. Um, every person that I'm talking with is, you know, on, they've got a bag full of pills, and they're at the doctor's office twice a week because it's free, and the doctor prescribes more pills, and then they end up in the emergency room because their pills are conflicting, and their pills are doing damage to their bodies. Um, and it's, it's really, honestly, incredibly frightening. Um, the amount of kind of lackadaisical, um, just the general lack of care for um, patients' records in Massachusetts is also really startling to me because, um, well, everybody's on the same insurance and everybody works for the same agency that's providing all of the health care, so we can all share records. Um, and it's really, really startling compared to, you know, 10 years ago when I was um, working in California in a system that was, you know, not great, uh, but it definitely wasn't like that. <laughs> Everything was pretty much paper-based. Everybody had to um, file a medical records request and it had to be signed by the patient so that the patient knew was giving permission to be able to share those records. And then even if they were sharing the records, it was really just sharing it with that particular office. And then whatever that second office did, they couldn't just send it right back to the first office. They had to give the patient's permission again to send that new information to the old office. Um, so seeing this kind of back and forth, wide open, everybody's records, and you're right, the whole implementation of um, electronic data keeping for medical records um, is, is really a frightening thing. Um, I'm exempt from that, which is why I wouldn't think that much about it. Um, if you have a practice that's small enough, you can still do paper records. And I hate the idea of being like a birth with a mother who's laboring and having a big glowing screen. Like, it just seems really like anti-natural birth. Um, it, it's yeah. really anti-personal health care also. Yeah. You know, you're standing in the hallway with this computer <laughs> typing. Uh, what are you allergic to? And not, I mean, not to mention the fact that you're shouting it down the hallway, okay. um, and you're making your patients shout. I mean, and healthcare providers just, in general, because we're we're trained by the state, we're licensed by the state. There, there is a general lack of concern about these issues. You know, you'll you'll see a shift change. Okay, so Mrs. Jones in room six who has the inflamed vagina. <laughs> um, and, um, and it's like, you know, well, what about that HIPAA paper I signed? It says you can only tell that to you know the government uh, <laughs> or, or a research institution. Um, and you know, I'll see EMS providers pull out the laptop and uh, this says we can treat you. No, it doesn't. Um, it's you know, I'm asking them to sign it. You know, and I'll say because oh, they haven't read the disclosure that they're asking the patient to read. They don't really know what it says. The patient doesn't know what it says. <laughs> oh, okay, when they sign it. Um, and what it says is all the provisions of HIPAA. Um, but they'll just tell the patient, yeah, this, uh, this says like you called us and we took you to the hospital or something. Um, and just shove it in someone's face. And that person is not exactly in a position of free agency when they're dependent on you. First of all, you're in their, they're in your vehicle. Um, you're sitting there with drugs that you can push into their bloodstream and so forth. Um, I wouldn't say it's a fair and equal relationship. But you, you touched on, on the Massachusetts um, and the universal care there, which, uh, I forget which Democrat passed that. Um, I, I forget all You ran for president. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> um, if, you know, I, don't, I hardly ever go to a grocery store because I go to the co-op instead, but 
I was in a grocery store a few weeks ago. I think I needed cat litter and the car was closed. Mm -hmm. And it was a fascinating moment. So, you know, these little things you don't notice when you're doing something often. When you stop doing it, you notice. So I was walking down the aisle, and the aisle I was walking down happened to be the, the snack cakes and chips and all that stuff aisle. And at the end of it was the pharmacy. And I come, it was around Christmas time, actually. And I come to the, uh, the pharmacy, and there was a sale. And I really didn't understand. It was a sale on uh, Simvastatin, which I don't really get. Like, why do you put it on sale? Everyone uses insurance anyway, and you ask the doctor for a month of prescription. But anyway, um, it was on sale you know, for, the, for the holiday season or something like this. And I was standing there, I looked at the sign, and I looked at the chips. <laughs> this is like one-stop shopping. This is great. <laughs> you come in here and get the subsidized agricultural products that the government pushes on you, as they push out actual food, um, and then you can come back to the same place and pay them again. I mean, isn't it great when, when people pay you for your mistakes? <laughs> Just like the patient with the, with the pills that now caused a conflict, and they're back paying the same doctor again. It's, it's, they don't notice it because their insurance company pays each time. So we're transferring money back and forth, um, and it keeps coming to the people who are, are causing the problem in the first place. <laughs> It, it's just fascinating to me. <laughs> the, um, the other thing I think that goes along with this whole affordable health care implementation is the fact that um, the providers who we've already established are required to be licensed um, are now required to accept the insurance because if everybody's on it, nobody's going to want to pay cash because, well, I have this and it's free, so why would I pay cash? Um, and then because there are so many people being covered and being paid for, um, it drives the price of the care up. Um, so the because that price goes well, back up. The state only has so much money. It's covering all of these people, so they want to pay the providers less for each, you know, moment of care, every interaction, every lab that's being drawn, every visit that is happening. They want to pay less for those. So in order for those providers to pay for the liability insurance that the state requires them to have, um, they now have to up what their total cost is to anybody who is not complying with the insurance. Um, so a recent example, um, I did some blood work for somebody who was a cash paying, refused to be insured individual. Um, and I said, as I usually do, I will do your lab work. I will send it through on my cost. And, um, and then you know, you'll get a cheaper cash you know, uh, price. So I did, except that the lab that I used, their drop box was closed. So I ran across the street to the hospital, and they have their own drop box. It's one of these you know, big labs. And I said, can you put my specimen in your drop box? And the lady in the lab said, sure. And she grabbed it. And I assumed it was going in the drop box, going to the exact same place. I just didn't have to drive back tomorrow. Um, so the patient eventually got the results, got their bill, and the bill for the, the initial lab that was supposed to be $70 my cost ended up being $470, and they're like, $400? What possibly could have happened? So I called the lab, found out that the lab that I had submitted, whoever was in the hospital that day who took my bag, took the specimen out, took out my requisition, and wrote their own as if they had drawn the lab, they had done all of the work, and submitted it and upped the cost. So for nothing other than put it in a box, <laughs> right? Of course, knowing that that's what happened, and because I have a small enough client base that I would notice that, and fortunately had a client who called and went, this is insane. Um, we're fighting about it at this point, but um, these are the kinds of examples of things that sometimes are done to get more money coming in. Um, and so a lot of times the cash paying individual, if you're going through the system, licensed providers, the hospital, um, you are ending up in a situation where you're going to be penalized and will end up paying more for things um, than the next person who doesn't have any ideals about it. <clears throat> Do you have anything to add to that? And there's also the provider side of that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's just one of the many ways I think that, and I don't think it's unconscious either, I think there's a conscious effort here that the providers are being pushed into either the large group or to work for the hospital directly. That um, I think that there is a, you know, a concerted effort to eliminate private practitioners, particularly things like concierge practices and boutique practices, 
Um, but even the small private practitioner, like the one I worked for before I became a paramedic, uh, with five internists, um, under a lot of pressure, and it's also becoming less necessary as the hospitals say, well, actually, we're not going to give you privileges. Um, we have a hospitalist group who will care for your patients when they're here, um, which the internists are like, oh, okay, I don't care what can up. That's fantastic. Well, you become a lot less necessary. It's much easier for them to cut you out of the process. And in the end, all these pressures kind of push you into, I think, into hospital practice, where nobody's going to rip your requisition form out and change it for somebody else's because it's we're using the same form. Why deal with harassment by hospitals? Why, why deal with all these issues with billing and every regulatory requirement when somebody else can do it for you? Which brings us to what are some of the things that can be done to reverse this trend? Because this trend has been going forward since my grandfather was a general surgeon um, from the 1940s until he retired in the late 1980s. And I remember his biggest issue was everything is going this direction. And I remember being a kid and being like, what are you talking about? You know? And he was like, this is the worst thing that's ever happened. All of this insurance kind of stuff where insurance covers everything as opposed to the original definition of insurance, which was kind of like you know car insurance where you pay into something and if there's an emergency and it's above and beyond what you can handle, then that's when insurance kicks in. Um, really drives it into the direction that insurance is going to start making decisions. And then, of course, when the state comes in and it takes over the insurance industry, um, then you're looking at the state making those decisions. Um, so some of the ways, ooh, who has, who has the legally kidnapped? Is that back there? Sorry, totally. He's one of the speakers. Yeah, but is, it, is, is his book back there Probably. on the bed? I wonder if he said he had a package when I asked him. Anyway, I got really excited. Um, um, there was a little bit. Legally kidnapped. Legally kidnapped. It's Carlos Morales' book. Carlos um, Morales. So a few of the things that I think would really help to reverse the trend, at least um, within communities that um, understand and value liberty and understand and value their um, ownership of their own bodies, um, is really to take that and hold on to it. Um, there is, I think, in some, um, st some areas, of the world. There are enough liberty-minded individuals to be able to care for one another. Um, New Hampshire being one of those. Uh, we have several RNs. We have a couple of doctors. We have a nurse practitioner that's moving up here next month um, who is able to do everything, <laughs> pretty much. Um, uh, there's a private practice uh, doctor that cares for the whole family that will do cash only and only care for uh, people that are liberty-minded. Um, so trying to keep your healthcare decisions within that framework and within that um, group can be really, really helpful in um, establishing a large enough network where it can become sustainable. Um, the other thing that you can do is to keep your medical records out of the hands of providers. Um, and with, at least with providers that are liberty conscious, um, the idea of walking into a doctor's office and saying, I want to see you, I have a health concern, but I want to keep my records. I don't want you to keep the records. And what that does is it completely absolves the provider from having to disclose anything because they don't have any other records. So if you hold on to your own records and you hold on to your own decisions and your own labs, um, then you ultimately have control of them because they do belong to you. The only reason that your doctor or um, your nurse practitioner or your naturopath or whoever, the only reason they're holding on to your records is really just for convenience. Um, yeah, the HIPAA form says that too. It says that you own your records and all that stuff, but it doesn't feel real at all. It feels like this imaginary <laughs> right. line that they added in. But, <laughs> yes. but if you don't, don't let worry, your citizen. doctor have a copy and you, t you keep your own records and when you go see them next time, you bring your records back so that they can review it, um, then that keeps it out of their hands. Um, and then the third thing really is to um, cash pay as much as you possibly can or, or um, see medical providers with um, some sort of agorist relationship um, where you're bartering for your care. Um, that also will help to avoid a lot of uh, government involvement. I know for me as a midwife, I am 150% more likely to care for a client who comes to me that I know has a um, philosophy that um, 
is not one that's you know going to go run and tell the state if I let the woman labor for more than 24 hours or whatever. Um, and that's why I primarily am working in Massachusetts because the majority of the families that way, you know, not only do they have that mindset, but they also don't really have anybody to go to to complain because the state doesn't even really see us. We're <laughs> <laughs> just this weird anomaly. Um, so those are the three, I think, biggest I, uh, steps that I feel like individuals could take. Um, oh, and, and one more I should add is um, learning how to care for yourself and for your families and um, your family and your friends. Learning as much as you can about um, self-care and emergency care. Um, there's a growing movement in uh, New Hampshire, at least, of families that are birthing their babies with nobody there because they can't get the kind of care that they're looking for. Um, and on the one hand, that's kind of sad to me, but on the other hand, like, I can definitely see it, and I'm super proud of those people for being able to um, take their, their own health care seriously. Um, but do you have any other things that you think would be helpful? Well, I have a question. Um, yeah. Why does that sad you? Um, it is something that, that's been curious to me, actually. I mean, I, I feel like there's been this push over, I don't know how many years, but to make childbirth into a disease and pregnancy into a disease <laughs> yeah. that requires medical intervention. Right. Um, so, yeah, I'm just not clear why. I think why because uh, my personal opinion of midwifery is that it's not the practice of medicine. Um, we're treated in some states as medical providers and in other states as not, when in reality we're probably more um, lifeguards. <laughs> you know, I mean, hate to bring that up with the whole birth pool idea, but um, but the, the, the original idea of a midwife really is somebody who just has experience with birth and um, can be there and be kind of a go-to person for, is this normal, you know, and just general support and can you make me some tea, you know, kind of, help, help us clean up because we're exhausted, you know, like that kind of stuff is much more what a midwife does, um, being able to recognize when things are not normal as opposed to really treating what's abnormal. Yeah, I have a friend, a good friend who's a midwife, and she says, yeah, it's, women have been giving birth for, you know, mm -hmm. thousands and thousands of years, no one really has to, you know, push, well, what else right. would I do? Right. <laughs> right. Right. Um, so I'm it's doing it for me. I'm curious, because I, I, and granted, you know, I'm in a, and I, live, I live here in New Hampshire, so in my encounter, my demographic's not normal by any means, but people, why, why do people, like, not care? I mean, we all, personal autonomy, is like a really central core value to most of us. Um, so why would someone say like, oh, Matthew, I don't care who knows my records. Like I hear people talking about their diseases and their medications and you look at this scar and like there seems to be this whole sense of like, oh, I don't care. I want, I want everybody to know all my stuff so they can fix me. And they don't think there's like, there's no conscious awareness it seems of that, you know, whether you just have no personal sense of self-worth or your body or, or this idea that, you know, I think most people don't even think about the fact that and I thought about this with medical records all the time. Oh yeah, digitize everything. I mean, I work I work in software, so I understand the dangers of this. But most people don't. So it seems like where is this disconnect happening? Of you know the the proud freestanding American that seems to have just been obliterated, where no one seems to care how vulnerable this the system makes them and how and how um, unhealthy it makes them. What where where do you see that disconnect yeah, I, is happening? Yeah, I see that a lot. <laughs> I, I, where people just kind of look at me cockeyed and they're like, why does it matter? Um, and I think it's because, I actually was, Jen, I was actually talking to Jen Coffey recently, and um, she okay. said, no, no, she's, <laughs> she's, she's a friend, she's a yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, But we, she was talking about the 1%, not in the sense of like the 99, you know, but um, whenever you're going to have surgery, for example. Somebody always says to you, now there's a 1% chance, blah, 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 or a 0.5%, you know, whatever um, chance. And, and most people just kind of go, oh, well, that's not me, right? So it's not until you become that 1% where you get hit as that minority person who suffers that you start to think, wait, where else am I vulnerable? Because th these things can really happen. Um, and I think that at this point, I mean, things are definitely changing, but at this point, I think there's still a majority of people that are like, oh, don't be so traumatic. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the state's not going to do anything. What do you think the state's going to do? Um, I mean, my, my daughter just um, 
a couple of days ago, came home from school, um, visibly shaken, she's 14, visibly shaken, to the point where I was like, do you need more warm clothes? What's your problem? Like she was shaking like a leaf and on the verge of tears and she told me that at school, and that's another long story why my daughter is even at school, um, at school the she was randomly selected to take a test and was taken into another room with a bunch of her friends and there were people standing around that she didn't recognize. They weren't people who worked at the school, they weren't her teachers. And she was given a test where the first two parts of it were, um, you know, was fill in the bubbles, you know, stupid standardized stuff. First two parts of the test were like reading comprehension, but then part three and part four were questions about does your family have a washer and a dryer? What is your parents' level of education? How many firearms do you have in your house? Um, all of these really personal questions. Totally, some of them were, were like random, like what kind of color of clothing do you like to wear? But it was, she said it was like they mixed in things that felt really benign with things that were really personal. Um, and she said, and I didn't answer any of those questions. And I was like, well, good for you. And then she said, but all my friends did. And she was terrified for them and she's mm -hmm. like, after the test, she was like, do you realize that they, that, I mean, that's personal information about your family and they could give that to who knows who. And so most of her friends were looking at her like, oh, come on, it's just a stupid test. You know, the government wouldn't do anything with it. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think that disconnect really does happen on a lot of levels, not just with healthcare, but just across mm -hmm. the board. And I think with time, as we start to hear more stories about how the state is but you know, the stories are out there now. Yeah. I, mean, I know, like I know, like the the gun rights community is very aware of this. Mm -hmm. um, I think, cause the, but they've always sort of been like for healthcare. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's I don't, with you know, like oh, the big you know the health insurance company getting all those records stolen. So people like know they're vulnerable. Yeah. But is it just because health? Because there's this whole meme about healthcare is not a product; it's a right. It's Mm -hmm. They're trying to completely reframe how people think of There's that. two layers of God complex above you with health care. When, it, when, you, when, it, when you're talking about gun rights, it's like you're, you've got your gun rights. Hi. Oh, look at this, sweetie. Um, you have gun rights, and then you have the state above that, right? When you're talking about health care, it's my doctor and then the state. So there's like two levels of people who were looking out for me, I think. Um, is the way people view it. So you have to really be, in, in order to have somebody who really listens to a fear about medical records being shared, you have to be talking to somebody who not only questions the state, but also questions their doctor's intentions. And the, the narrative is sketched in such a way that ostensibly your doctor like, doesn't even really like the state and is sort of on your side against the, you know, right. there's this narrative that's sketched such that the the, the, the state is here to protect you from the predatory doctor, and the doctor is here to look after you despite the regulations of the state, when obviously, really, it's sort of a kind of thing, you know, show for your benefit. To, you know, it's Bad cop, like, good cop. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that um, I have a more pessimistic view on, on this. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I really don't think that it's all that unique to healthcare or mysterious. It's just that um, when I deal with a gun rights person, for example, they understand the dangers of registration of guns. Um, but I can't always trust that same exact crowd, um, having done free aid a lot of um, CCDL, Connecticut uh, Citizens for Defense League um, organiz uh, events, I can't trust them to not also be in favor of war. Um, there's there's these, this single issue effect where you don't get spillover of one liberty position into another. Um, you know, we, we have a huge motorcycle lobby against helmet laws, but it's a lot of the same people who are riding their motorcycles in parades to cheer on the veterans and, yay, soldiers and more. Um, I think, the, and the reason I'm a pessimist on this is that I don't think human society could have evolved to the point that we're at without just this very ingrained behavior of trust, that our default position is trust and faith in the intentions of the people we, we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And that will always be our default position, unfortunately. Um, and that would be great if there weren't these bad actors out there. Um, or if there were just a few of them and you could recognize them. The problem is the bad actors are not only, it's not that they're numerous, it's that they're in positions that we give legitimacy to. Um, people give this magical legitimacy to the state and to their healthcare provider. 
um, and healthcare providers love it, um, and the state loves it. I mean, who, who doesn't like this feeling of, of godness, uh, so to speak? <laughs> right, so I'm overgeneralizing. <laughs> but I've dealt with too many <laughs> providers who you know, don't, don't think like us or never even questioned. I mean, medical training is devoted in large part to training you to be a god. I mean, what are you learning when you're called doctor in your second year of medical school? Oh, it's just in front of the patients. Oh, so it's a kind of lot of patients, right? As long as it's in their best interest? Huh, I see. Because they would feel weird if you weren't, if they knew you weren't a doctor, so we'll just lie to them. That, that's cool. Um, and I don't see that going away. And the reason I think you get these single issue groups is they've been hit or they have noticed and woken up in one area. But it doesn't spill over because that's still our default position. And if it weren't, we wouldn't be fully human. <laughs> but if it is, I think you have to change the institutions around you. I don't think you can rely on people losing their faith in those institutions. What time is it? Do you have time? It is 12.45. Okay. Does anybody have questions? Maybe so do you think the opposition to the ACA might help? <laughs> well, I mean, great. the last speaker, the one who was talking about trying to stop a train as an individual? <laughs> but, I'll say, is, is the op but if people have this natural opposition, they think, oh, I don't want the government running my health care, is that the opening to say, yeah, and here's some more reasons why the system they've got, which they're just perpetuating, I mean, is it, is it, is it even worth the fight? Is it? Uh, yeah, I, I, I take it outside of the norm route, I think, in that. I'm, I'm not, I don't use insurance for anything in my own family's health care, um, and I, I kind of, I, I don't know if it's, you know, um, naive of me, but I kind of feel like they're going to do whatever they're going to do because they really are, <laughs> and maybe I'm, I'm pessimistic from my experience in California and, um, you know, how the state honestly, like, will consume things, and it just does. Um, and I think that a lot of the change comes from individuals making individual decisions to live outside of that. Um, but that's me. I think when, when you look at a movement like, you know, we're, we're opposed to the ACA, um, it helps to, to break it up into subgroups and say, okay, what are the different motivations that go into this opposition? And how much of it is, it's not the way I grew up. Um, it's the same way, I, you know, I'm in education, we have Common Core. There's a lot of criticism of Common Core, and you know, I, I'm, I've, 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 I hate Common Core. You know, it was one of the great push, things that pushed me out of high school was being told, well, you know, the Common Core thing is happening. We really should get in line with it. Okay, well, I'm out of here. I'm not going to run this department anymore. Um, and yet, there's a lot of bad arguments made about it too. The, the most popular argument against Common Core seems to be that's not how I learned math, and I turned out just fine. <laughs> well, it, and, and the same person who says that also complains when the cashier at the grocery store doesn't know how to count back change or can't use the three cents in his hands of them, well, there is a reason that Common Core included counting back by tens. That's what you're complaining about with the change, <laughs> that they can't go up to ten and come back down. Um, so I think you know, there's a lot of bad opposition to the ACA also, a lot of status quo opposition, a lot of pretending what we had before the ACA was just fine. And, and that seems to be what happens with these advancements of statism is well, uh, it'd be the, the so-called libertarian or free position comes to be the previous statist incarnation, um, no matter how bad that was. And yeah, but you got so many people lining up, well, we, well, we don't want government in charge of our health care. Let's go back to when the insurance companies were running it more directly. Then the really good thing to the you know, full steam ahead of affordable health care is that it's not a sustainable way of doing health care. So it will eventually collapse, um, even if it doesn't fully collapse, collapse. Like I said, just, look, just going across the border into Massachusetts and seeing the state of things there, I get way more calls to Massachusetts, mm -hmm. even though none of their insurance covers anything that I do. The people there are more than willing to pay cash to be able to get good care than to get substandard care that they get, quote unquote, for free. Mm -hmm. um. I, maybe I just don't know about this, but do they, does the Libertarian, does the Free State Project have a list of outside of insurance health care providers? Um, I mean, that we can, like, I know someone in northern Massachusetts, an excellent, mm -hmm. unbelievable chiropractor slash uh -huh. craniosacral. Great. Doesn't take 
insurance. So. It would be really neat if we put something together like that. Um, free aid is basically kind of the place a lot of people go to to say, is there somebody you know around? Um, but as more people are moving to New Hampshire, there's definitely more health care providers I'm seeing move. Um, like I mentioned, um, Lisa, who's a um, nurse practitioner that's moving up uh, next month. So it would be nice to put a, a list of some sort together. But there, there have been attempts in the past. I've heard of people trying to put almost like a you know a list of all the different types of services that free staters can have, you know all, can offer to each other. Um, but that has been difficult because a lot of those, you know, are people who are supposed to have a license or whatever, and they don't want to be listed. People will end up in prison if it's right. right, exactly. Yeah. So the shot. word of mouth as you are here longer, you know, tends to be the way a lot of people go. But when it comes to um, some of the health care providers that are around that are not afraid to do that, then I missed a lot of healthcare providers. I mean, I've never been denied service because I wanted to pay cash for something. Right. And I got much better. About last time I went to the doctor, I said I'm paying cash. Mm -hmm. I got 45 minutes of his undivided attention. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. You know. I mean, you said well, we got denied. We, we got denied. No, I mean, it depends. I mean, it was a small office. He wasn't in a hospital. Um, yeah. Some. I mean, some yeah just don't want to deal with it. They think you're a kook. But there's a lot of like chiropractors. All of them will take cash. I mean, most of them hate insurance because yeah. it drives the price up so much. So yeah. I think if. I mean, maybe you just have to be out there. You have to be the actor. You have to say, "Hey, can I just pay cash for this?" Mm -hmm. And can because if you're not, if no one's asking them, mm -hmm. and maybe there's there's an awareness issue. And and shop around. Sometimes the places that will deny you for paying cash are typically in network mm -hmm. insurance providers, so they're required mm -hmm. to see a certain number of patients every mm -hmm. day. So mm -hmm. they get you know four minutes per patient. It's like boom, 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 boom. Get through them, and you know, and then the insurance basically pays their bills. Um, when you're an out-of-network provider, which is what I am, then people can choose to try to apply their insurance, and their insurance will pay a percentage, and they pay some of it in cash, and it's a huge headache for the out-of-network person because then they have to go and bill it. Like, I just did a birth in uh, November. I still haven't been paid for the first prenatal, <laughs> you know. Um, so there's definitely an incentive for them to just get the cash up front so that they don't have to go through their bill or pay their bill or do all the waiting. So, uh, chopping around and looking for those. Do you have any other questions? Okay. Awesome. Anybody else you want to add? I think we've touched on stuff. Yeah. 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 Yeah.